How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So today, I figured it's about time we go back to the Hoenn region for one of the hardest types I've tackled so far, that being the bug type in Pokemon Sapphire. There really aren't that many encounters available here, as I've only got Beautifly, Dustox, Masquerain, Ninjask, Shedinja, either Volbeat or Illamise, since they're both available only on one route, and either Pinsir or Heracross, since they're both in the Safari Zone. So that means we're working with seven Pokemon no matter how you slice it, which is why I'm not banning Shedinja. After all, there's so many trainers in this game that counter Wonder Guard that it's not even that crazy. Anyway, make sure to subscribe to the channel as only 9 out of every 1,000 unsubscribed viewers ended up subbing last month, and I'd love to see that hit at least 20 by the end of this month. Not to mention, if we hit 110,000 subscribers, I'll be uploading part 2 of the Soul Silver Pokewalker Professor Oak Challenge. With that said, before we grab our first encounter, I want to give a huge shout out to this video's sponsor, Friends and Dragons. Friends and Dragons is a mobile, free-to-play strategy RPG available on the Apple App Store and Google Play that combines the elements of hero collection, strategy, and puzzle gameplay. When I first started playing, I didn't think that a strategy RPG and puzzle game would fit together, but surprisingly enough, it does. During my first session of the game, I spent around three hours and got through nearly four of the eight chapters of the campaign and enjoyed myself all the way through. And yes, if you like Pokemon, you'll probably like this too. There's over 150 heroes to collect and upgrade, and the battle system reminds me of a simplification of Pokemon, sort of, as there's five types, red, blue, green, light, and dark. As the first three make their own rock-paper-scissors dynamic, and light and dark are effective against one another, sort of like how the dynamic you'd see with the dragon type in Pokemon. I also have to say, the satisfaction of taking out enemies in one turn by sheer strategy, placement, and the right units was amazing and makes me want to continue playing in my spare time. Speaking of which, if you'd like to play alongside me, you can join me in the Meat Guild by searching for it in the Guild Hall. So what are you waiting for? Download Friends and Dragons from my link in the description, or scan the QR code on screen to get a special starter pack. This includes a rare Mythic Summoning Scroll for a guaranteed 4-star hero with a 10% chance of getting a 5-star, a Premium Summoning Scroll, 500 gems, talent tokens, gold, and XP to level up your heroes and the town. With that much summoning going on, you'd think it's a game of modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Once again, shoutouts to Friends and Dragons for sponsoring the video and continuing to make this content possible. So, the first Pokémon that I'm going to be able to capture is Wormpole on Route 101. Whichever one this evolves into, I can get the other cocoon in the Petalburg Woods, which does put a little bit of a damper on things, seeing as one of them won't have tackle early on, but that's really not much of a loss. The second encounter on the list is the 1% Surskid over on Route 102. Of course, this is a pain in the bum to get, but with it, a ton of the game will be easier, thanks to the access it gets to water and ice type moves. Before I proceed onward though, I did a wee bit of grinding to have the level advantage on each trainers, getting Wormpole to Silcoon at level 7 before moving through the capture tutorial and making it into Petalburg Woods, the home of our third encounter in Cascoon. The Aqua Grunt here is no problem, so I'm able to move on into Rustboro City and into Route 116 to capture an Encada. Four encounters before the first gym is fantastic, and since we've got the ground and water subtypes, along with Beautyfly knowing Absorb and Dustox just being a fully evolved Pokemon, Roxanne should not be much of a problem. She's got two Pokemon, first of which is a Geodude that falls immediately to Surskit's bubble, leading into Nosepass. Now, this is where things get a bit hairy. Most of my Pokemon can't take much in terms of rock moves, but upon switching into Ninkata, I can set up a half dozen sand attacks, and since ground resists rock, this thing's able to only hit me for neutral damage with Rock Tomb and Rock Throw. Add on the fact that I can potentially lower the damage output of this thing even more by using Harden makes Ninkata a force to be reckoned with during this fight. I set up two Hardens before going for Leech Life, as her accuracy shouldn't be good enough to get through the recovery I get every turn. But she is hitting an awful lot of attacks through six Sand Attacks, so many that Ninkata's pulled down to two HP. But a critical Leech Life from Ninkata, backed by a second next turn, puts Ninkata back in the game, leading to a potion. This goes on and on for turn after turn, and since Roxanne's got two potions, I have to do this dance a third time after seeing a third critical Leech Life connect. 
Eventually, Ninkata runs out of Leech Life power points, so I've got to swap over to Scratch, and while I could have gotten Fury Swipes to do a bit more damage here, I figured it would be a bit smarter to keep the move with higher accuracy over damage since a Nuzlocke is all about consistency. A few scratches after the 15 uses of Leech Life are enough to put Nose Pass down for good, winning me the Stone Badge. Not too bad for bug types, but if this was Kanto or Sinnoh, I guarantee this match would have ended in a squash. There's really not much in the way between here and Brawly, and while I do like skipping this gym in casual runs, we have a level cap to adhere to. So after grabbing the letter from President Stone, we're whisked on our way to the isolated Duford Town for another gym battle. Brawly also has two Pokemon, but since Beautifly has Stab Gust, we're in for an easy fight. Starting out as Machop, going down to two Gusts, even through Bulk Up. Pretty good attack if I do say so myself for Beautifly. Second out is Makahita, and I'm just gonna keep clicking A, and sure enough, Beautifly is able to do the same thing, two-shotting through a Bulk Up to win. Hope you enjoyed that last easy gym leader, since the next two were going to be a living hell. Before we reach that living hell though, grabbing the EXP share is key so that we can use our less useful bug type Pokemon as EXP dumps while using others like Beautifly and Dustox since they're so good as fully evolved Pokemon early on but lose usefulness sooner rather than later. They also both get Morning Sun and Moonlight respectively, making them relatively decent stall mons in the face of anything that doesn't have a super effective attack, though that's not really the case with the next gym leader. Before we can get to him though, we've got a rival battle with Mei. This is usually considered the hardest rival battle in the game, but I feel like I'm more than prepared here. She leads off with Whalmer, so I go with Dustox, and by this point, we've gotten protected by level up, meaning that Whalmer's not going to be able to hit more than one shot of rollout before I can block her from continuing. Thankfully, Confusion is able to inflict status on Whalmer, leading to back-to-back -to -back Confusion hits that allows Dustox to use Moonlight and go into Combuskin with full HP after KOing it. Confusion unfortunately can't two-shot Combuskin, but neither can Ember two-shot us, so after seeing us outspeed, he hits Ember, but then next turn goes for Focus Energy, allowing for a third Confusion to be hit in safety, leaving just Shroomish. Gus does nearly half as she sets up a Stun Spore, but I figured I'd just swap for Beautifly and hit a Stab Gus to take this thing out, since I don't want to be here longer than I have to be. Just after this is Mauville City, the home of the third gym leader, Watson and electric types are a bit worrisome. Not because of weakness, other than Beautifly of course, but because of the paralysis and confusion statuses. Thankfully, this is why we kept Ninkata unevolved for this fight, as the ground type gives it an electric immunity and gives me more than one HP to work with. I've also got Surskit unevolved here, but that's because it learns its best water move at level 25 in Bubble Beam, and Masquerain doesn't learn it, so yeah. Going in here, we have to fight three Pokemon, first of which is Magnemite as I lead with Ninkata, going for Sand Attack once again to make Supersonic and Sonic Boom miss. I'm able to land five of them before a Supersonic lands, eating my Person Berry that I got from Route 104's Berry House, and letting me hit the last one before swapping into Surskit. This can't be one shot here, though swapping in and getting hit with a Sonic Boom kinda hurts. It's mostly focused on status though, so it alternates between Thunder Wave and Thunder Shock, allowing for Surskit to hit three bubbles before a Thunder Wave lands, leading to some more misses, some full paralysis, and another bubble that leads to a Super Potion on Magnemite. It continues to miss and I continue to get full paralyzed, but Bubble's eventually able to land four more times, KOing, but not before Surskit takes another Sonic Boom. Surskit's not going to be able to make any more impact here, so I swap into Dustox, taking a critical spark from the newly entered Voltorb, but it only does half, completely recoverable by Moonlight, so we're all good. A second spark lands for 13 damage, so I go for Protect next turn and hit the lottery ticket, seeing the self-destruct and avoiding all the damage, KOing and leaving just Magneton. I swapped back into Ninkata here to take a Thunder Wave with its immunity, then I went back into Sand Attack strats, landing all six of them before a Sonic Boom lands. Pretty good, Ninkata is still usable later on, but for now I can swap back into Dustox and start laying into it with Psybeam now that it's level 24. Unfortunately though, I had neglected to account for Shockwave, so it's time to go back into Ninkata and hope I can survive through all of the Sonic Booms and Supersonics. This is relatively easily done thanks to Leech Life, and every time Supersonic lands, I'm able to just swap into Beautyfly, baiting a Shockwave and going back into Ninkata. I figured upon swapping back into Ninkata, I could hit a scratch to see how much it did, but it's nothing special compared to Leech Life. So I just kept going for it, eventually getting enough of them to land past 40 HP, which lets Ninkata live through two Sonic Booms in case they happen to land, but that really hasn't happened yet. 
as the sonic booms keep landing as I swap into Beautifly for some reason. It's kind of funny that it happened twice, but other than that, there's nothing else to talk about here except for the second super potion making me have to do more of this fight. But I'm eventually able to work through it, eventually coming out on top and winning the fight, evolving into Ninjask and splitting off into Shedinja afterwards. Sweet! That was a bit rough, but I'm glad I had more HP to work with on Ninkata instead of trying to stall with Shedinja. Directly after the gym, I figured now was a good time to head over to Route 117 and grab my next encounter to fill up the last slot of my team currently, that being Volbeat. This is the reason I'm playing Sapphire version right here, as it's a 19% encounter and Illamise is a 1%, and vice versa in Ruby. As much as I'd love to have an Illamise to use some Encore shenanigans, I already have Wonder Guard and Volbeat with Tail Glow seems pretty based all things considered. I've got to take care of Mount Chimney before going towards the Lava Ridge Gym, and it's got me thinking that having the TM for Ice Beam on Masquerade would be really useful right about now, seeing as Archie's Golbat kind of wrecks my team at this point. But I've got no choice seeing as I've barely got any cash extra laying around, mostly because I'm buying a lot of convenience items like repels and healing items. Guess I'll have to suck it up for the time being. Archie leads off with a Mighty Anna, so I go with Mask Rain, getting Intimidate off and swapping for Dust Talks since Dark Types are special in Generation 3. But upon seeing the Sand Attack, I figured swapping back for Mask Rain would be best to get another Intimidate drop and shake off the Sand. Unfortunately though, my brain started scrambling here, thinking that doing this more than once was a good idea, taking more damage on Mask Rain than I really should have, so I healed Dust Talks with Moonlight and attacked him with Gust, but of course he's back to Sand Attack. It makes sense, the game's getting payback for my strategies earlier in the run, but for now I can just PowerPoint stall him while trying to hit Gust, but Moonlight's only got 5 power points. So upon getting too many accuracy drops to count, I swap into Ninjask, using Leech Life in the attempt to KO, but of course he survives on what is seemingly 1 HP, living to see a Super Potion come down, but that's fine as two more Leech Lifes finish him off, leading to Golbat. I don't really have a clean swap here, but Dustox is probably best, using my last Moonlight while taking two wing attacks. I'm definitely in a bit of a pickle here upon using Protect, so I go back into Mask Rain for the Intimidate drop, and seeing it go down to 12 HP and proc my Orenberry is a wee bit scary, so I've gotta go into Beautifly here and see if I can land a Stun Spore to stop him. And sure enough, I'm able to, but two wing attacks are able to bring him into the red. I figured I'd try baiting a full paralysis turn with Morning Sun, but even through 5 uses of that, I didn't get a single one. So I swap into Ninjask, and that's when I see the full paralysis turn. At least I finally found it, attempting to go for sand attack strats afterwards. He's paralyzed again, and then for a third time in a row, letting me get 3 sand attacks off before a wing attack lands for massive damage, but I'm still going for it. I don't have a choice, and thankfully I'm rewarded, landing 6 of them before going for Swords Dance. I don't have anything to hit this thing with other than Leech Life, so plus 6 is the only way I'm KOing this. And even with that much attack power, Leech Life does only around a sixth of Golbat's HP, and I only have 6 power points, so perfect, right? Well, upon another wing attack landing, he's able to use a second Super Potion, taking Ninjask offline, so I've got to swap into Dust Tox, taking a wing attack down to 4 HP, and landing 2 side beams in a row to KO, leaving just Sharpedo. Fortunately, I've still got a full HP Volbeat in the back here, but I'm not sure if it can survive two crunches, so I sack Beautifly in order to get a clean swap over, using Confuse Ray as he uses Focus Energy to hopefully keep him off attacking me as I charge up a Tail Glow. This does end up working as he hits himself for about 30%, then does the same thing next turn as he outspeeds, but Shockwave's able to land and pick up the KO for the win. Seeing Beautifly go down here is a shame, but it's not like I'm planning on bringing it into the league anyway, and quite frankly, it's already pretty useless. Moving into the Lava Ridge Gym was an experience, since I accidentally messed up the puzzle and ran into a trainer with a Kecleon that had Faint Attack, taking out my Shedinja. I really expected this thing to have nothing to touch this thing, but that's what happens when you don't have trainer move data for a game like this. Hilariously enough though, I wasn't planning on using Shedinja for the league either, so I potentially still have my full league team if I play my cards right. Which I immediately fail to do, seeing as the Flannery fight tears me apart, and fully on my own mistake. After using Bubble Beam to take out the first Slugma, I tried using Masquerade's Water Sport to lower the power of Fire-type moves, only to see Sunny Day immediately come down. I figured Slugma would go for the 4 times super effective Rock Slide here, and since Slugma's attack is so piss poor, Masquerade would have survived, but the roll of the dice just didn't go that way. I do make it to Torkoal intact, but upon swapping into Dustox to tank Overheat, 
I don't have enough special defense or HP to do so, leading to a KO. I've got three members left, so I go back into Mask Rain, failing to intimidate because of white smoke and going for Bubble Beam. I was really hoping this would be a two-shot, but once again, sun's up, and of course it wouldn't be. And to rub it in my face, Overheat gets a crit to take out Masquerade. Maybe Ninjas can survive this thing at minus four, setting up a sword stance and KOing with Dig, but she immediately jumps on a track as I go for sword stance, holding Ninjas down enough for it to not land a single Dig, KOing with Overheat, and leaving just full beat to fall to the same fate, failing the run. Well, that didn't go well. Let's see what we screwed up. First of all, I didn't EV train. I probably should have, but honestly, I didn't think I was going to have to do it. But then again, I'm using friggin' bug types. I should have seen this coming. Anyway, after a second failed attempt due to getting poor luck to Roxanne in terms of crits and sand attack, the third attempt I decided to do 252 HP and special defense EVs on Dustox, 252 special attack and speed on Surfskit, 252 special attack and speed on Beautyfly, and 252 attack and speed on Ninkata. I was actually able to achieve a boatload of this before the first gym, since the first two were Silcoon and Surskit that I had managed to capture, so I just switch trained them on level 4 Ralts on Route 102, giving them 20 EXP each every fight and giving them enough EXP to safely get through the two required fights before Rustboro, those being the Yuckster with a Zigzagoon on Route 102 and the Aqua Grunt in the Petalburg Woods. Thankfully, the first gives a speed EV, which we're getting for both of those, and we have two blank EVs for each of our Pokemon, since they only give a stat point per four EVs, but we're giving them 510 instead of 508, so yeah, math. Don't you just love it? Anyway, I'm able to grab Cascoon here as well as Ninkata from Route 116 without any extra fights, since the double battle on Route 104 doesn't actually trigger unless you talk to them, so we're pretty much set for EV training. I'm able to fully train Ninkata before Roxanne due to it being part of the Erratic Egg group, making it very slow to level up at the beginning, but faster later, while Surskit and Beautyfly got around 65% of the way through their training and Dustox rounds 55%. Sure enough, this made Roxanne a bit of a joke, as Surskit one-shots Geodude with Bubble and Nosepass is another 6 sand attack and sweep combo, though it did get a critical on Dustox that led to it going down to 2 HP, but... We're all good, and going into Brawly, almost everything but Dustox is fully trained. Though, upon training Beautifly in Special Attack, instead of getting more attack EVs like we did on our last attempt, which happened to be accidental, Gus just wasn't able to two-shot Brawly's team, making it more of an effort. But nothing that I couldn't work through. The same thing happened with May, with Dustox basically soloing the fight, and the only other change I made before Watson was giving Dustox the TM for Psychic, seeing as I was able to make quite the chunk of change for it, though I did have to get some coins from doing the weird ball game in here. I don't know what this is actually called, I've never been to Vegas. Anyway, going into Watson, I do the fight as I tried last time, but I end up getting destroyed thanks to a bit of bad luck with Sand Attack. Upon review, though, I realized that I can actually just use Shedinja here. See, Shedinja's immune to everything except Magnemite and Magneton's Supersonic and Voltorb's rollout. The latter is easily outable by Dustox's Protect like I did with May's Whalmer, and the other two can easily be stalled by doing switch baiting with Shedinja and Beautyfly, as the latter's a flying type and will easily bait out either Thunder Wave, Thunder Shock, or Shock Wave in the case of Magneton. So, after resetting for attempt number 4 and doing all the same stuff, Shedinja's effectively able to stall out the 20 power points of Supersonic on Magnemite, hit 3 Screeches, and destroy it with Fury Swipes. I swap for Dustox on Voltorb and take it out in a couple of Psychics, though a critical rollout was a bit worrisome, but once I made it to Magneton I basically already won, since without Supersonic, Magneton has no physical way of beating Shedinja, winning me the fight. Before we can continue into uncharted territory for this video though, I still have to take out Archie and Flannery. First up, I did find a way to get recurrable money without having to fight people to get the TMs for Masquerade and Volbeat, and that's from Route 113. See, after getting the suit sack from this guy, you can run around in the dusty grass, pick up the suit after every step, and trade it in for flutes that are then sellable. Boom! Infinite money! Wasn't that easy? Well, now that I have Ice Beam for Masquerade and Thunderbolt for Volbeat, the latter of which I've also trained in HP and Special Defense like Dustox, I'm able to tear through Archie, seeing as Mighty End is a two-shot with Volbeat's Signal Beam, which I figured would be a better use of a move slot than Tail Glow. Sweeping with a Volbeat's just not viable. 
Golbat's out next though, so I go for Thunderbolt, doing a wee bit under half as he does the same with Wing Attack. So I go for Moonlight, healing back to full as he misses with Supersonic, but then I miss with Thunderbolt thanks to the single Sand Attack from Mighty Yenna. So I'm kind of just stuck sitting here in front of Golbat as a heal with Moonlight, waiting for him to be dumb and go for Supersonic, but clearly that's not happening. So I click Thunderbolt on a low roll, bringing it down to a sliver as he does the same to me, bringing Volbeat to 2 HP and leaving him open to a Thunderbolt on the Super Potion, which lands, then a second Super Potion comes down, and Thunderbolt's then able to two-shot from here, leaving just Sharpedo. I wish I could stay in here, but 2 HP is not good to say the least, so I swap into Dust Ox to essentially stall out the crunch, taking one for a quarter as I go for Gust, taking another for another quarter. This is perfect, since two uses means that I can heal them off with Moonlight, and Protect just further increases the speed at which I can take this out. And sure enough, after a bit of running through his crunches, and admittedly risking a critical that I could have avoided if I had used Moonlight a turn earlier, I'm eventually able to take down the big bad shark, leading to Flannery. Here, I'm able to make the easy play of bubble beaming both Slugmas with Masquerain, then swap into Dustox to tank an overheat from Torkoal with the HP and special defense EVs we so carefully cultivated. Then I alternated between Protect and Moonlight to stall out whatever attack came next. Body Slam barely does anything, and Overheat I just have to stall 5 power points to make this thing a non-issue. And thankfully, Dustox is able to do just that, giving me the chance to swap into Volbeat, do some damage with Thunderbolt, swamp back into Dustox to hit a Psychic, and finally swap into Mask Rain to tank a Body Slam that paralyzes, but thanks to a Held Cherry Berry, Bubble Beam's able to land next turn, KOing and winning me the 4th Gym Badge. And dang, no losses up to this point. Maybe I should plan fights and calculate stuff more often. Sweet, and upon exiting the gym, I'm able to get the Go Goggles from May, opening up our next encounter in Anorith. I neglected to mention this in the intro because I always forget that Anorith exists, and when I do remember it exists, I think it's rock water like most other fossils. Anyway, I EV trained this thing in HP and attack, since despite Anorith having a good speed stat, Armaldo loses it in exchange for defense, so I think I'm better off with more HP so that I can take more damage from either physical or special attacks. Anyway, the next gym leader is literally no problem whatsoever, seeing as both Anorith and Dusthawks have Protect, and that's about all that needs to be said about Norman. Oh alright, I'll talk about the fight. See, Norman's slackings have the ability Truant, meaning every other turn they cannot attack, so if you just Protect on the non-Truant turns, you physically cannot get hurt. Now yes, Protect has only 10 PP, so this strategy is only performable for a little bit of time, but against two of these things, I'm not likely going to make it with just 20 power points combined, but that's what Lepa Berries are for. It's basically an ether that triggers as a held item, instantly healing a move of 10 power points when it reaches zero, and that doubles the potential of Protect. The first lacking falls to a myriad of Metal Claws from Anorith, leading to Vigoroth, the only real danger of the fight. However, with Anorith being so durable, I'm basically able to throw out three Metal Claws and take Vigoroth's stat attacks handily, KOing and leading to an attack boost off of the Metal Claw. Last out is the second Slacking, and I'm able to just protect, Metal Claw, gain attack again, then repeat twice more for the KO in the win. Hilarious that Anorith literally solos a gym with two Pokemon that have a base stat total of 670. That is how broken Slacking is, if you can just get it without Truant. Uh, that's why Skill Swap is such a good move, but I digress. With Norman defeated, there's only one obstacle in my way between here and Fortree City, and that's a rival battle against May. Thankfully, I stayed well under the level cap with Pokemon not named Anorith and Dustox, so this fight should be plenty doable even after all of the encounter trainers on Route 119. Also fun fact, before going towards Route 119, I picked up Hidden Power to see what types my Pokemon had. Two of them had fighting, which is cool, but not necessarily amazing with Heracross coming soon. Another had dark, but that's special in this gen, therefore not the most useful. But Masquerain. Masquerain has the electric type. Basically giving me a pseudo Thunderbolt Ice Beam combo on one of our Pokemon, and essentially making Masquerain the king of the team, especially with Winona coming up. But let's take out May first. She leads off with Whalmer, which still has Rollout, but I've got a new tool in hand, that being Sludge Bomb on Dustox. There's a TM available after getting the 5th badge from Norman over in Duford Town, and since Dustox is the only one that can learn it, say goodbye, Gust. It's able to do a hair under half to Whalmer, leading to a rain-boosted water pulse that doesn't do jack and Whalmer gets poisoned off of the second Sludge Bomb, so I just use Protect next turn to let it go down to poison damage, leading into Combuskin. 
This Combustion literally only has P.E.K.K.A. super effective damage. Why does this thing not have a fire move? I just land two Psychics to take this thing out, leaving just Shroomish. Also, why isn't this thing a Breloom yet? Either way, I'm able to just chuck a Sludge Bomb into its face, barely missing the KO as she lands a Headbutt for minimal damage, going down to Psychic next turn and winning me the fight. She's really getting to be a pushover. Hopefully the Lily Cove fight can give me a little bit more of a challenge. Anyway, we're 9 time, and I'm actually able to get to her level cap unlike Norman, and Masquerade should lead us to victory, with Volbeat as a backup with Thunderbolt, and potentially even Anorith. The High Flyer leads off with a Swallow, and despite leading with Double Team, Ice Beam's able to land in KO immediately, one down, three to go. Pelipper's out second, and here's where Hidden Power comes into play, immediately KOing it and leaving just Skarmory and Altaria. She goes for the latter though, strange decision for the AI to make seeing as it just saw Ice Beam, but Masquerade outspeeds and KOs, leaving just Skarmory to go down to two hidden powers after landing a Sand Attack. Glad that didn't start spiraling out of control immediately, but that's the sixth gym badge in the books. Would have been a little bit harder without hidden power, but honestly I would have just led with Volbeat at that point if we didn't have HP Electric. Nothing much to really comment about on the way to Lily Cove City, aside from a random Milotic trainer that gave me a bit of a scare. A few war flashbacks to Cynthia, but nothing to worry about. We just gotta make our way to Lily Cove and for the final rival battle of the run against May. She's packing a new Swellow, and as Winona tried doing before, she leads with Double Team, but Ice Beam lands and immediately puts this bird down. Thank you, Masquerade. Second on the list of casualties is Combustion, going down to two Bubble Beams after once again only having Peck as their only super effective move. Can someone please tell me why this was a good idea? She goes for Bulk Up, which is an even weirder choice instead of Peck, but I'll gladly keep full HP on her last two Pokemon. Third is Whalmer, and Hidden Power Electric is obviously the way to go, nearly bringing Whalmer into the red as Water Pulse lands and confuses. Well, that's a little bit of a problem, but fortunately, she has replaced Rollout with Mist, which is completely stupid, and she goes for it. So I'd rather just stay in an attempt to hit HP Electric, and sure enough, next turn after the Mist, I'm able to get out of Confusion, KOing, and leaving just Shroomish to fall to Ice Beam. Masquerade is really coming out to be an MVP, and I am loving it. I've never used one of these things before in a playthrough, and I'm really learning the value of it. Though, I think that's also because of HP Electric doing more than necessary. Next up is clearing out the Aqua Hideout, and no one's any trouble here. Even Admin Matt, whose Carvana falls to Volbeat's Thunderbolt, Sharpedo to Signal Beam, and Mightyena to three Signal Beams after a Super Potion and a Field Swagger that was negated thanks to a held Person Berry. Sorry buddy, better luck next time. This finally frees up the ocean to the east, letting me get over to Moss Deep City, the home of the seventh gym leaders in Tate and Liza. Neither their Soul Rock or Lunatone have a Rock-type move, so I'm not really worried about leading with Beautifly and Masquerade here, since super effective Giga Drain and Bubble Beam boosted by Miracle Seed and Mystic Water respectively sounds pretty darn tasty to me. So I go into the fight and try double targeting Lunatone, since I see Calm Mind being the biggest threat of the fight, so I go with Giga Drain Bubble Beam, and I'm just short of KOing, leading to Calm Mind. One shouldn't be a problem when the only real attacking move it has is Psychic, so I shift over to hitting Soul Rock with Giga Drain Bubble Beam, as it set up Sunny Day last turn, and Flamethrower's not exactly in my best interest. But sure enough, after a critical Giga Drain, it goes down in a heap, leaving Bubble Beam to land on Lunatone. This still doesn't do enough damage though for Giga Drain and Bubble Beam to KO next turn, but upon seeing a second Calm Mind, she's not in healing rage, and this is an easy KO from here. Another Giga Drain and Bubble Beam combo KOs and wins the match. Dang, I didn't expect to come out of here damageless. And yes, Soul Rock would have gone down if Giga Drain didn't crit. I was just lucky. Time for the story to grab us by the balls and at least have one major fight during this time, and that's against Archie. Though having to bring another HM slave towards this place was pretty dumb. The only one I could find that could do the job to get through all of Seafloor Cavern was Sharpedo, since I needed Strength, Rock Smash, Surf, and Dive to get in here. But fortunately I got one and made it to Archie. He leads off with Mightyena, so I go once again with a Person Berry equipped Volbeat, hitting a Signal Beam for over half as he goes for Scary Face, then healing with a Super Potion, leaving him in range for me to hit two more Signal Beams. But he's actually pretty smart, swapping into Crobat before the third Signal Beam lands to KO. 
That's pretty heads up, but I'm able to swap into Armaldo, taking a Confuse Ray with the held person berry negating it, then taking an Air Cutter to land an Ancient Power for the one-shot KO. Not too bad, but this baits out Sharpedo, so I gotta swap back into Volbeat. Fortunately though, my speed is back from the scary face, and on switching, Volbeat gets hit with Swagger, eating the person berry and giving me the attack boost to KO both Sharpedo and Mightyena with one signal beam apiece, winning me the fight. Sweet! And with one encounter with Kyogre later that involves leading with Ninjask, so I have a 100% chance of running away, it's time for Wallace. And this fight is actually insanely easy. See, I could just give Ninjask a person berry and just in case Love Disc's Water Pulse gets the confusion proc, but it doesn't, so I set up three Swords Dance, then KO Love Disc, Celio, Milotic, Whizcash, and Wall Rain, all with one Aerial Ace apiece, winning the fight. Well, guess that EV training and crap certainly paid off for me. Alright, six more battles. One against Wally at the end of the Victory Road, the Elite Four, and the Champion. After training up my party to level 48, I'm able to run through the road and make it to Wally. His team's interesting, but I'm not sure if it'll hold up. He leads off with Altaria, so I, of course, shocker, lead with Masquerain, Ice Beam, and it's gone. Second out is Magneton, and I figured this would be baited next, so I swap into Armado, dodge a Supersonic, and KO with an Earthquake after a Supersonic lands, and immediately gets negated thanks to a Person Berry. Two down, three to go, and out comes Delcaddy. And since the only thing I'm worried about here is Sing, I just go for Earthquake after using Protect and hope it misses. And sure enough, it does bringing Delcaddy down to the red and leading to a Super Potion that really should be a Hyper Potion at this point, so a second Earthquake KOs, leading to Roselia. I thought about going for Earthquake for a second, but swapping into Masquerade makes more sense here as Ice Beam is a very nice move. Leech Seed lands as I come in, but that's fine as Ice Beam's able to KO and Gardevoir comes in and gets Leech Seed. Huh, I thought that was activated before a new Pokemon came in, but it's not going to make a difference, as I was going to swap out into Volbeat anyway, seeing a double team come out as Signal Beam lands and nearly one-shots, but it does get the confusion, letting him hit himself and get KO'd with a second Signal Beam after yet another Super Potion that does absolutely nothing. Alright, that wasn't too bad, and now we're right before the League, it's time to finalize our team. First up, I need Heracross. This is easily catchable by doing the Pokeblock glitch over in the Safari Zone. Basically, this means putting a Pokeblock into the little canister that's in the middle of the grass, running into the Pokemon of choice, and then giving it a different color Pokeblock. In this case, I gave the pedestal the red Pokeblock and Heracross the green one, and since it was curious about it, I was able to lock it in, it had no chance of running away, and I could just chuck a bunch of Safari Balls to get it. Final team time and we're going in with Volbeat, Masquerade, Heracross, who's trained in attack and speed as I've yet to establish that, Dustox, Armaldo, and Ninjask. I left Shedinja behind because literally everything in this lead can hit it, and Beautifly is just not high impact enough. At least Dustox is a much better tank for what I have access to. Leave a comment down below if I'll win this attempt or not with your predictions, and how many Pokemon I may lose during the league. With that, let's rip these guys' heads off. I'm about tired of playing this game. First up is Sydney, so I lead with Volbeat, going for Signal Beam and taking a takedown and KOing with it next turn. Absol's out second since it's got Aerial Ace, but this idiot decides to set up Sword Stance despite being slower, so I'm able to just two-shot with Signal Beam even through a Citrus Berry, KOing and leading to Sharpedo. Minus one is enough to hold this Signal Beam back from being a KO, but Swagger is able to change that, leading to a Person Berry healing off the confusion and allowing Signal Beam to one-shot Sharpedo after a full restore, Cacturn, and Shiftery winning the fight in short order. This is pretty normal with E4 level caps, the first two members are usually jokes with the levels being off by one or two between members, and with that, after shifting around the items, I'm able to just go into Phoebe, leading off with Ninjask. I gave it a person berry just in case Dusclops here would go for a Confuse Ray, but it never went for anything of the sort, instead going for two Shadow Punches as I set up two Sword Stances, leading to a Baton Pass over to Heracross, and a one-shot sweep with Hidden Power Ghost, KOing Dusclops, Bayonet, Sableye, Bayonet number 2, and Dusclops number 2. Well, at least there was more than a single ghost type line this time around. Should have probably still brought in Mischievous and Gengar to have a proper team here. 
two down, three to go, and after shifting around the items yet again, I was initially leading with Ninjas going into Glacia, but then I realized, wow, that is a really dumb idea. Within a few seconds, I just swapped straight for Heracross, and that ended up being a fantastic idea. See, without a single boost, Heracross is just able to one-shot sweep on the back of sheer stab, super effective, EV boosted power of Brick Break, taking out Glalie, Celio, Celio number two, Glalie number two, and Walrein winning in five turns. Again, would have liked if this team had something like Lapras or Jinx representing, but we can't always have what we want. Last up on the lineup is Drake, and he's honestly the only one I've got to work to beat. Well, yes, Masquerain can sweep through Shellgon, Flygon, and Flygon number two with Ice Beam. Salamence is able to outspeed and go for Fly. Now, if I had Protect, that'd be great, but I have the next best thing, as I can swap into Armaldo, tank a Fly and a Dragon Claw, and nearly one-shot Salamence with Ancient Power, trapping him into a Heal Lock, and while I don't outspeed, he can't do enough damage to KO since Armaldo's got Battle Armor, preventing the chance of a critical hit connecting, letting Ancient Power eventually KO after taking a Flamethrower. Last up on the team is Altaria, so I just swap back in the Masquerade, taking a Dragon Breath and KOing with Ice Beam to win the match. Perfect! All that's left is the champion, and I'm going in Deathless as a matter of fact. Leave a comment below if you think I can get through Deathless. Once again, after a bit of a reshuffle of held items, it is time. Steven's got a ton of Rock and Steel types, so I'm in for a beating, but I should make it out relatively fine if I play my cards right. Starting out here is Skarmory, so I go out with Masquerade, landing an HP Electric, as he misses with Toxic, letting me hit a second for free to KO. Well shoot, that's a freaking great start. Toxic not hitting here basically makes Masquerade so much more useful for later on in the fight, though with Clade all coming in, that's not happening anymore, as Bubble Beam's only able to do a little under half, as Ancient Power does 4 times super effective damage, taking Masquerade below half. That's fine though, as Heracross can come in, tank it, and nail Megahorn to KO, healing some of the damage with the Shell Bell. Seriously, figuring out how to get this thing with an emulator was a nightmare. Anyway, third out is Armaldo, and Brick Break does over half, healing off the rest of Claydol's damage as Aerial Ace lands, bringing Heracross dangerously close to death at 9 HP as Brick Break finishes it off. Half down, half to go, but Heracross is worse for wear, and since he's bringing in Metagross, we're in a rough position. He's going for a random move because of how low my HP is, and my guess was incorrect. I went into Volbeat on Earthquake instead of a profitable switch like Masquerade, but that doesn't even really mean it's profitable because the fact that Metagross has clear body means that Intimidate's not going to work, but I digress. It's fine as I'm able to take that in a Meteor Mash and deal out a Signal Beam, though now Volbeat's left on 2 HP and not able to do much anymore after Protect. Half my team is nearly dead, but I think Armaldo's the play here, so I swap, take a Psychic, and go for Earthquake upon a miss of a Meteor Mash. I thought it would KO from this range, but I'm just short, proccing the Citrus Berry and leading to Armaldo going down off of a Meteor Mash. I honestly thought it would survive, but I forgot to calculate the fact that he got plus one off of one of the earlier attacks. Completely fine, our Deathless streak is over, but I'm able to just go for Heracross, outspeeding and nailing Brick Break to KO, leaving just Angron and Cray Dilly. He goes for the former, an easy, quad effective strike from Brick Break puts him down, but man, that's not enough recovery from that. But hey, last Pokemon's Cray Dilly, and it just so happens to be weak to Megahorn, one shotting to win the match. Way to go, Heracross! This thing has been putting in work throughout the entire league, and it certainly makes up for the lack of appearance from it beforehand. But yeah, that's Sapphire with only bug types, and boy howdy does planning these runs in advance really help out. The first two attempts were a bit more blind like I usually do, but here I was like, nope, this isn't gonna cut it for this one, I gotta use my brain, and as a Yu-Gi-Oh player, that's pretty difficult. I'm used to just flipping up a floodgate and expecting my opponent to do the thinking, but I can't rely on anything but myself in this case. And sure enough, after writing a detailed document on all the important fights, I was able to just get through with only one death, and that was to the champion. So, that was pretty much a win in my book. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do next time, but I'll make sure it's enjoyable for you guys. See you guys then. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, and tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that, since if you are, you're taking too long. I want to give a huge shout out to my $5 and above patrons, Justin Dimmenstein, Aiden Brandon, Andy, Casper Kirkpatrick, Heimflow, Jacob Johnson, Sean McKay, Zeno, Aaron H., 
Aaron Ladeau, Austin Rose, Box of Turtles, Cryptic Gamer, Leon Montelgray, I'm sorry I'm gonna butcher your name every time, and Zachary Kiever, thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to support as well, you can head over to my Patreon page, link in the description, where for only a dollar a month, you can get access to stuff like videos early, as well as an exclusive role in my Discord server, link also in the description. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.